I'm taking YouTube viewers through my book, Authorized, The Use and Misuse of the King James Bible. I am building a case that the excellent King James Version, despite all my love for it and all the verses I've memorized in it, poses more readability difficulties because of changes in English over the centuries than most people are able to recognize. And today I'm going to get to the chapter in my book that has the highest nerd quotient, chapter four. Are you a word nerd like me? Good. We're gonna talk about computer-based readability tests. People who defend the King James Version, even exclusive use of the King James Version, are well aware that others claim that it's difficult to read. One wrote, every new Bible that hits the market attacks the King James Bible with the flat out lie that the King James Bible is too hard to understand. They all claim that the King James Bible is too archaic. You can't understand the Elizabethan language. It's just too difficult to understand. This is the number one reason people lay down their King James Bible. Now, that kind of rhetoric, calling translators of other English Bibles liars, is what has kept me away from directly engaging KJV onlyism in my book, Authorized, and except at certain points, and this was one of them. Once mud starts flying, it's difficult for anything edifying to occur. But this particular claim was really important to quote verbatim. And I found courteous defenders of the King James Version who basically said the same thing. R.B. Ouellette is among the most gracious that I've seen. I've actually had a little personal correspondence with him. And he, in his book, A More Sure Word, relies directly on computerized readability tests. He writes, quote, recent evaluation shows the reading level of the King James Bible to be fifth grade as a whole. Many individual passages would be lower. The modern Bibles are shown to be between sixth and ninth grade levels as a whole. The modern versions claim to increase readability when in reality they often make readability more difficult." End quote. Now, I've heard this sort of thing for many years. On the one hand, defenders of the King James Version will say that all it takes is a little elbow grease and a dictionary and you can read the King James just fine. On the other, they like to say that the King James is actually easier to read than contemporary translations. And they appeal to computers to prove it. They appeal in particular to the common flesh Kincaid readability analytics test, the one that tends to come bundled with word processors like WordPerfect. The same writer who called complaints about the King James Version's readability a flat out lie said, we scientifically and grammatically compared the ESV to the supposedly archaic, hard to understand King James Bible. We copied the complete New Testament text of the King James Bible and the ESV into text files with no modifications, no editing, but exactly as they came from QuickVerse. We opened the King James Bible and the ESV New Testament text files in Corel WordPerfect. We then simply performed the grammar checking function within WordPerfect. And what was the result? The King James Bible literally blew the doors off the ESV, the following verifiable scientific results do not lie. These are the relevant results as reported by av1611.org. Flesh Kincaid grade level for the New Testament, King James Version, 4.32. ESV, 8.22. Now, those numbers are so specific. In our culture, we're used to bowing before precise numbers like this because science. Science has spoken. The King James Version is at the difficulty level not just of a fourth grader, but of someone one third of the way through fourth grade. The ESV is at the difficulty level of someone one fifth of the way through eighth grade. You can't fight science, so do I just need to pack it up and admit that I'm wrong to be concerned that even if dead words and false friends exist, they aren't any bar to understanding the King James Version? I'm a reader. I've been reading since the age of four in 1985, and I am currently the father of a fourth grader. I know the King James Version is not on a fourth grade reading level, but when I first encountered arguments like this, appealing to uh, objective numeric measures, I didn't have an answer. And I knew it. I didn't know how readability test works. I remember the day when I was sitting at work thinking about all this stuff instead of the stuff I was supposed to be doing. And I realized that it was going to fall to me to figure out what is going on with readability analytics in the King James Version. I remember just kind of sighing like, oh, I'm busy. Why do I have to be the one to look all this up? I went and talked to an elementary school reading expert I knew who happened to be in a nearby cubicle, hoping that she had already done the work and could explain readability analytics to me. I'm afraid she wasn't much help. She knew when to use readability analytics, but she didn't know how they worked any more than I did. I remember her shrugging her shoulders. Mine slumped, then stiffened. Let's do this thing, I said. I say thing sometimes just to be cool. I turned to Wikipedia to figure out what the Flesh Kincaid readability analysis actually does. It turns out, surprise, surprise, that this tool cannot read. It does what computers do best. It counts. 
flesh Kincaid is an equation that looks like this. The flesh Kincaid analysis, like basically all the other readability analytics tools available out there in the world, measures precisely three things, words, sentences, and syllables. All the fancy numbers and parentheses in the equation are just ways of trying to end up with a number between 1 and 12, in other words, a grade level. This tool, like all others, operates on one generally true assumption. Shorter sentences and words are usually easier to read than longer ones. But I'm going to give you three reasons why the Flesh Kincaid tool simply doesn't apply to the Elizabethan English of the King James Version. First, these tools, like the Flesh Kincaid analysis and others, measure a word's complexity by syllable count, but that's not a reliable way of judging whether a word can be understood. Wikipedia's entry on the Gunning Fog Index, a related tool, says, while this index is a good sign of hard to read text, it has limits. Not all complex words are difficult. For example, asparagus is not generally thought to be a difficult word, though it has four syllables. A short word can be difficult if it is not used very often by most people. Sucker, S-U-C-C-O-U-R, is a two-syllable word. Besom is too. The phrase to wit contains two one-syllable words. Not too complicated, but I've never used any of these words or phrases outside of reading and discussing the King James Version. Sucker, American spelling is without the U, and besom are very occasionally used in Nigerian, British, and other non-American forms of English, but almost never in America. And none of the major available computer tools has any idea. None of these grading tools can judge how rare words and phrases are in a given English dialect. Likewise, show, S-H-E-W, and seth, S-A-I-T-H, and other words that inexperienced King James readers may stumble over, they aren't difficult per se, but their spellings are strange by modern standards. That has to be a factor in readability, but Flish Kincaid doesn't measure spelling. It sees no difference between S-H-O-W and S-H-E-W, or between C-A-L-L -L and C-A-U-L. It's not reading, it's counting. Two, word order or syntax plays no role in these reading level analyses. Archaic vocabulary is a significant problem for readability. I don't believe that competent speakers of contemporary English should be required to look up English words in a Bible translation when commonly known equivalents are available. But word choice is not the only readability issue in the King James. There's also word order. But the major computerized tests don't take word order into account. Play no role word order can, Yoda has pointed out, until smarter computers get. For example, Colossians 2.23 in the King James has always tripped me up. I understand every word individually, but not when you put them together. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh? What is will worship? Each word is simple and commonly used, but put them together and I don't know what they mean. And what does that last phrase mean? Not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. I know what satisfying the flesh means, but not in any honor to, that's too hard for me. I, I don't understand it. Does flesh, does Kincaid? I can make much better sense of the modern translations of Colossians 2.23. They're all easier to read, but several of those translations have higher readability scores for that verse. The King James is at 15.4 for that paragraph. The New King James is at 17.8, but listen to it. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. I find that to be much easier to understand. Or the ESV, even though it's at a grade level of 18.1, listen to it. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now, some of these words in these two translations are difficult. Asceticism is a difficult word. But whereas the easier words in the King James Version were combined in such a way that I couldn't understand them, I know what honor is, but I don't know what not in any honor to means, asceticism is at least a word that high school, let's say, educated person might understand. Certainly a college educated person would. Word order, not just vocabulary, is also a readability issue in the King James Version. The order of the words in what profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it makes the statement difficult. Is the graven image a direct object of profiteth? What profiteth the graven image? Or is it the subject of profiteth? 
Modern versions use modern syntax, which is easier to read for modern people. And yet, Flesh Kincaid doesn't measure syntax or word order or grammar. It can't. Three, typography plays no role in these reading analyses. Now, this point is admittedly minor compared to the other two, but I believe it carries more importance than most Bible readers realize. The NIV, the ESV, and other recent translations characteristically use paragraphing and indenting of poetic lines more than most King James editions. Now, let me hasten to add that there have been King James editions with excellent typography, even paragraphed editions going back into the 19th century. But most King James editions, and admittedly a lot of NASB editions, New American Standard Bible, most I see today turn every verse into a separate paragraph. And I would argue that that's not helpful for careful, contextually sensitive reading. It tends to invite atomization and proof texting, causing people to treat verses individually rather than as parts of longer discourses. Other things being equal, this formatting isn't as readable as this formatting. Also, as I've mentioned, the King James Version uses a different system of punctuation marks than we're accustomed to as contemporary readers. I don't blame the King James translators for the lack of quotation marks, for example. They weren't standard in 1611 when our punctuation system was still developing, but a lot of the colons and semicolons in the King James might as well be random symbols for all the good they do me, ignorant as I am of what they meant in 1611. So we're left with missing punctuation, especially quotation marks, and the nested quotation marks that can be a big help in the prophets, and other punctuation that just doesn't fit modern rules. I've said typography is comparatively minor when it comes to readability, and it is. But in biblical poetry, it can sometimes be pretty significant. I was just studying Amos as I help lay the groundwork for a new commentary being put out by my uh, employer at the time, Lex Press. I was outlining the book and I came across some obscure statements in chapter five. Uh, it's not totally clear where the paragraph breaks should be and people disagree over them. For example, verse 10 might be the last verse of a paragraph or the first verse of the next one. You can skip over this interpretive problem if you just don't do paragraphing, but written English demands paragraph breaks. It's a necessary part of the written language, and it's a helpful part of the written language. Paragraph breaks help me follow what's going on by showing me how a verse connects with its context. That happened to me in Amos as I was reading. It helped me get through some obscure material. Placing poetry in poetic lines to show off the parallelisms is also super helpful for readers of Old Testament poetry. But many King James editions, especially older ones, fail to do this work for the reader. You can say, we shouldn't give the reader any helps that God didn't put there. We should make him do the work. And maybe sometimes that's true. But for most of my reading, I want and need some help. <laughs> Try it if you never have. Try reading poetic lines set as poetic lines rather than as prose. You will see what I mean. Again, I said typography is a comparatively minor thing, but it points to the simple fact that all of the dimensions of written English need to be evaluated if we're going to come up with an accurate idea of a text's readability. And no computer can do this. Only humans can. Flesh Kincaid does not measure any of these other dimensions of written language. The word nerds at the University of Pennsylvania's language log put this a bit more stiffly than I would, and they're talking about journalism and not Bible translation, but they're, they're basically right. They said, at some point, People should look behind the label to see what a metric like the Flesh Kincaid score really is and ask themselves whether invoking it is adding anything to their analysis except for a false facade of scientism. I want to run a fun and nerdy little experiment to show you that Flesh and Kincaid, poor guys, cannot read. I picked some random text from the King James out of Genesis 13. I then replaced a bunch of the syllables in the real King James version with the nonsense syllables bub and nub. Someday the world will thank me for doing this important work. This is real scholarship, folks. Take a look. Here's the King James. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him. <laughs> herdsmen, we be brethren. And here is the bub verse. And Abub went bub nub of Egypt, he and his wife, and all nub he bub, and lot with bub into the south. And Abub was very bub and bubble, and bubber in and nub, and he went. <laughs> and between ub herds bub and rub herds nub, for we ub brethren. These two paragraphs have exactly the same number of sentences, seven, words, 183, and syllables, 226. And they therefore have exactly the same flesh Kincaid readability score, 7.8 but obviously one carries meaning and the other is gibberish. It's gobbledygook. 
If my computer were a person, it would know immediately that one paragraph is English and the other is nonsense spread out in between some English words. But my computer is not a person, and neither is yours. My computer doesn't know, because the flesh Kincaid analysis didn't ask it to know, whether anyone can actually understand the text it's reading, quote unquote, reading. Our computers will just do what we ask them to do, even if we ask them dumb questions. Replace every other English word with a Swedish word, and as long as you have the same number of sentences, words, and syllables, you'll get the same score. Rearrange all the words completely randomly, and as long as you have the same number of sentences, words, and syllables, you'll get the same score. Here's the point. The flesh Kincaid analysis has no idea whether the words it's reading are understandable to every English speaker. It can't see dead words and false friends because nobody asked it to or taught it how. It has no idea whether the word order or punctuation or spelling of a text that it's measuring will trip up contemporary English speakers. It isn't reading, it's counting. Now that counting may be helpful when applied to basically contemporary texts. It provides a rough rule of thumb evaluation. Children's librarians and SEO gurus online can use it as a quick and dirty tool to give them a rough estimate of readability when they don't have time to read a bunch of text themselves. But the tool doesn't work on archaic and obsolete English. It wasn't designed to. I've heard arguments defending King James readability based on the KJV's Flesh Kincaid scores many, many times over the years. I think that in authorized the use and misuse of the King James Bible, I proved beyond the ability of a computer to doubt that the Flesh Kincaid test just doesn't tell me anything useful about the readability of the Elizabethan English of the King James Version. Now, by proving this, I didn't prove that the King James is unreadable. That wasn't my aim at all. I only proved that computerized tools can't answer the readability question for us. After my book came out, I did hear from one defender of the King James Version, someone who has used it exclusively for his entire life, who said, I was convinced by chapter four. I will never make this argument again, and I'm sorry I've used it before. That little note meant a ton to me. It was humble. It was Christian. Praise God. You don't have to agree with me about the King James overall to agree that it's at a sixth grade reading level because computers say so, is not an argument people should anymore use to defend the King James Version. In our next video covering chapter five of my book, we'll talk about why all this nerdy effort I'm spending is necessary and, I hope, worthwhile for the body of Christ. We'll talk about how valuable it is that God chose to use vernacular Hebrew and vernacular Greek to give us his words. I'll build a case that Indonesian Bibles should use vernacular Indonesian, Russian Bibles should use vernacular Russian, and English Bibles should use vernacular English. Stay with me. We're going to really let the Bible speak for itself in more ways than one.